Okay, this sermon is entitled, Sincerity, Niceness, and Commitment Don't Mean You're Saved. I'd like to open up with prayer. And then with a few verses, all right, dear God, thank you for giving us your clear word. Thank you for allowing us to see what it says. Bless the listeners. I ask all this in Jesus' name, amen. Psalm 7 reads, O Lord my God, in thee do I put my trust. Save me from all them that persecute me and deliver me, lest he tear my soul like a lion, rending it in pieces, while there is none to deliver. O Lord my God, if I have done this, if there be iniquity in my hands, if I have rewarded evil unto him that was at peace with me, yea, I have delivered him that without cause is mine enemy. Now, there's this false notion out there that a person must be saved if they're sincere and they're nice and they're committed. And this does not make somebody saved at all because this is how Satan deceives people. He gets people to remain lost because they exhibit these traits and yet they go unevangelized because everyone just assumes that they must be a Christian. And just because somebody appears to be some nimini piminy over-scrupulous, puritanical, goody-two-shoes with a bunch of dotted eyes and T's with cross-strokes who never steps on a crack doesn't mean they're saved. Because salvation is not about how a person lives or how a person behaves. Salvation is about what a person is trusting in. Turn over to Romans chapter 10. In Romans chapter 10, we have a classic example of people who were committed, who were fervently devoted, and yet the Apostle Paul declares them unsaved. It reads in verse 1, Brethren, my heart's desire and prayer to God for Israel is that they might be saved, for I bear them record that they have a zeal of God, but not according to knowledge. That would be your commitment. That would be, perhaps, sincerity. It goes on in verse 3, For they, being ignorant of God's righteousness, and going about to establish their own righteousness, have not submitted themselves unto the righteousness of God. Now, what is the one factor, or the one common denominator, in all false converts? Well, that would be a false righteousness. That would be people going about to establish their own righteousness, perhaps because they think they keep the law. Or maybe they've turned from their sins. Or they are quote-unquote holy. Well, the reason why this doesn't work and the reason why it doesn't save is because this is not equivalent to the perfect, unattainable, impeccable righteousness of God. And anytime a person attempts to be righteous by their own doing, it will always come short. That's why it says these people are ignorant of, of God's righteousness. They're going about to establish their own righteousness. And the conclusion of the matter is, is that they have not submitted themselves unto the righteousness of God. Verse 4 continues, For Christ is the end of the law for righteousness to everyone that believeth. So, the only condition for salvation is to believe on Christ. It's not about personal righteousness. It's not about sincerity. It's not about niceness or commitment. Because there are unsaved atheists out there who are sincere, who are nice people, and who are committed to something. Now, this reminds me of this unsaved devil. And I'm just going to call her out. Her name was Jerry. And everyone at the church that I attended at the time thought she was saved. She had a perfect attendance. She was very prim and proper. She was perhaps nimini piminy and over-scrupulous and puritanical and a goody-goody two-shoes. But she was unsaved because she was trusting in herself. Now, I figured this out very simply by letting her read one of my gospel presentations, and she flat out just said, I don't believe it. And it was basically making it clear that salvation takes place at a nanosecond of belief on Christ alone, and that you're eternally secure. She did not believe that. She thought believing was not enough, and she also mocked the concept of faith alone, and she said one time that you can't just live any way you want to and go to heaven. Well, she was on her way to the devil's hell at that time. In her sincerity, in her niceness, and with her so-called diligent commitment. And her testimony validated the fact that she was not saved either, because it had no mention of faith, no mention of grace, no mention of Jesus, 
No mention of the gospel at all. It was just some type of osmotic synergism between her and God that just happened all of a sudden by chance. And that's not a valid testimony. So we need to understand that being sincere, being nice, and being committed will not save you, and they also do not prove you're saved. Because in Matthew chapter 7, we have all of the above. And they were claiming that they did wonderful works in the name of Jesus. They were calling him Lord, Lord. And they were bragging and boasting and vaunting about their works, about their lifestyle, about how they lived. And Jesus told those people, I never knew you. Depart from me, you workers of iniquity. And the reason why sincerity, niceness, and commitment don't save is because we're all sinners. And that's why salvation is by grace, through faith alone, in Christ alone, and one of the main reasons why people stay lost is because they don't see their need for salvation. They perceive themselves as a nice guy, a nice person, a model citizen, a pillar of the community, a persona grata, somebody deemed as a VIP, a very important person. But that does not mean that you're born again. That does not mean that you're saved. And that does not mean that you've had faith in Christ for salvation. So watch out for this deception. This is how Satan dupes people into thinking that oh, all these nice people must be saved. When in reality, some of them might not be. And that's why we need to preach the gospel to every creature, like Jesus said. That's all I have. Let me go ahead and close in prayer. Dear God, thank you for giving us your clear word. Thank you for allowing us to see what it says. Bless the listeners. I ask all this in Jesus' name. Amen.